Um, I'm delighted to introduce our keynote speaker, Chris Hewlett. Uh, Chris is the co-founder of Octopus Ventures, one of the UK's largest venture capital firms. Uh, Chris is responsible for financial strategy at Octopus, as well as expanding into new business areas, uh, including, most recently, uh, impact investing. Chris has always been a leading advocate of impact investing in the space, uh, and in addition to being a board member here at Clearly So, uh, Chris was named alongside his co-founder, Simon Rogerson, as 2017 EY's Entrepreneur of the Year. So I'm sure you'll all agree that we're very lucky to have Chris with us today to take us through his journey into impact investing. So without further ado, please put your hands together and welcome Chris Hewlett to the stage. Uh, well, thanks so much for the introduction, Harry. It's uh, great to be here, and thank you much to Rod and his team for the introduction to uh, for the opportunity to speak at this uh, at this event today. I'm really proud to be a non-executive director of Clearly So, and I've long admired the company's work uh, in this sector, really as a trailblazer to to try and catalyse change. I think it's been such a a powerful presence, and absolutely delighted to be able to take part in this event. Now, in the next 20 minutes or so, I wanted to share with you a little bit about our journey into impact, why we've gone into some of the sectors that we have done, uh, but also why we're so excited about the future of this industry, what we think lies ahead of it, and, and why we're seeing what I believe is a real step change in the level of engagement and interest from investors around the world, uh, and the power that impact investing really has to reshape the world for the better. So let me start with a little bit of brief background about Octopus for those of you that may not have come across this before. I started my career in 1997 as a graduate trainee at Mercury Asset Management uh, here in London. And I stayed there about two years before leaving with a couple of friends from Mercury uh, to set up Octopus uh, about 19 years ago uh, when I was 23. Uh, everyone told us we were mad and that it would never work. Uh, and we worked in my lounge for the first month because we had nowhere else to go. And after a month or so, we moved into our first office. Uh, here it is. It was above a cost-cutter supermarket in Farringdon. Uh, we had three desks. We had a telephone. We had an ancient laptop that was about an inch thick. Uh, we had a copy of the Yellow Pages and our combined life savings of about £20,000. And it took us nine months of cold calling using the Yellow Pages to raise the money that we needed to start the business. Uh, we raised about £2 million from about 85 individuals. It's the hardest thing we've ever done to raise that money. Uh, but many of those people are still shareholders today. And we grew up a lot in that first year. Uh, we earned no money. We had to get our girlfriends to pay our rent. It, it absolutely toughened us up. And we certainly didn't have a fancy business plan uh, or really a clear idea of what we we're going to do. But we did have a dream, which I think was the most important thing of all. We thought the financial industry was a bit broken. We thought it was fixated on offering clients products that didn't really meet their needs. We didn't think it was an industry that was very good at listening to its clients. Uh, and we wanted to have a crack at doing something about it. Uh, we've grown the business over the years to the point where today we manage about eight and a half billion pounds on behalf of thousands of retail investors and about 40 institutional clients. Uh, and we now have about 800 staff. And it's been a lot of fun over the years. Uh, a lot of hard work, but also very satisfying. Like most businesses, we've tried a whole bunch of things that haven't worked. We've experimented with things. And when we found something that does seem like it's working, we tried really hard to keep growing. We've never shied away, though, from being willing to try new ideas. Over the last decade or so, we've expanded Octopus into several main areas, uh, renewable energy, healthcare infrastructure, venture capital, and specialist property credit. And I'd like to say this is all part of some master plan right from the start, right from day one, but it wasn't. Partly because sectors like renewables didn't really exist back then, but also partly because we hadn't realised how important impact was going to become for investors. I think it's fair to say that over the years there have been times when, across my colleagues, there's been a bit of cynicism and scepticism about how this sector was going to really evolve. Uh, not everyone has always immediately grasped the opportunities that impact was going to bring but I think we absolutely can see it now. We're really proud of the sectors that we're in and the contribution we're able to make to those sectors, not only in delivering attractive investment returns to our clients, but also the things that people really care about, creating jobs, helping to 
drive decarbonisation or building the healthcare infrastructure that the country's demographic time bomb needs. And one thing we've learned over the years is that having a purpose is so critical for any business. It's the glue that holds everything together. We feel very strongly that making money is, is not a purpose. The way I think about it, the way we assess what we do as a business, is to compare it to this simple test. What do you want to be able to tell your grandchildren that you achieved in your career? And that's kind of why we get out of bed in the morning. It's to work hard every day to be able to say that we made a difference in, in some shape or form. You know, Octopus is now in two of the least trusted and least customer-friendly industries uh, in the world. Financial services, which we've now been doing for nearly 20 years, and energy, where about three years ago we decided to create an energy supply business uh, to start to sell electricity and gas to, to residential customers in the UK to challenge the big six. These are sectors that I think really matter to people, and they're in need of changing. Now, we've been investing in early-stage companies since 2001. We've backed hundreds of them over the years, and it's great to see how the environment for entrepreneurs in the UK has changed so significantly. Now there are incubators everywhere, uh, easier access to angel investment, and new sources of finance such as crowdfunding have emerged. There are so many opportunities for entrepreneurs to build businesses that respond to the changing world. Consumers are looking for new solutions, new ways of doing things, and they'll back businesses, uh, they'll back products from new businesses. The idea that companies that can only point to decades of existence are the only ones that consumers will trust, I think is just not the case anymore. I remember uh, when I was a kid how my grandfather used to tell me that his small business banked at Midland Bank because they'd had a branch in the village where he lived for about 100 years, and to him that was really important. Uh, he used to go in every month uh, for a chat with the manager. That was how he had built his trust in that organisation. And it was all about the longevity of it as, as a bank. Whereas think about today, hundreds of thousands of consumers trust their money and their data to digital startup banks that have only been in existence for a few months or, or a couple of years. New businesses that really stand for something, I think, that behave in the right way, that are able to really resonate with their customers, that have products that have been produced in an ethical manner, uh, that have real values and personality. Those businesses, to me, feel like they have a real opportunity to thrive. I think they capture the spirit of these times. And the exciting part is I think the investment community is ready to back them with the capital that they need. If you ask investors in our Titan VCT why they invested in the product, they might talk about the tax benefits uh, or the potential returns. But invariably, they'll also say, I like the way my money's helping to create jobs. Individual investors, they may not use the same phraseology that we would all use. They may not talk about impact or sustainability, but they care. Investors want to do the right thing. Big businesses are being held to account. And I think everyone recognises the challenges facing the world, whether it's tackling climate change, dealing with social issues like housing, ensuring that jobs are created. A change can happen very quickly when society thinks it's the right thing to do. When people feel that a cause has real authenticity and importance, support can build rapidly and particularly nowadays, often amplified by social media. Uh, take plastics. I know we're hearing from uh, Sky in the next session. Their Ocean Rescue Initiative has played a key role in getting people talking about this issue. And David Attenborough and the Blue Planet Programme have also focused on highlighting the problems of plastic. Who isn't now aware of the issues that this causes? And who would have thought that Michael Gove would become a leading force in campaigning for the environment? Uh, it, the humble plastic straw seems to have gone from mainstream use to pariah status in just a few months. And it's not just trendy bars in Soho that now uh, are not using plastic straws. In response to the campaign, you've got firms like McDonald's that have had to take steps to eliminate their use. And it's this kind of societal change that creates opportunities for forward-thinking entrepreneurs to take advantage to produce the new products that meet the evolving expectations of consumers. And impact investors can play their part in this and be the key driver of enabling the creation of the solutions that are so desperately needed. And I think climate change is another area that fits this bill. It's gone from being of mild interest to the general public to being absolutely front of mind. It's something that people absolutely do care about. The renewable energy sector is one that we have been very active in over the years. Uh, and I think it absolutely uh, demonstrates the ability for investors to catalyse change to really bring about an evolution and growth of a sector. Uh, we started building solar farms in about 2010, when solar was very much in its infancy in the UK, and since then we've built about 150 solar farms around the UK. This country has been on an amazing journey when it comes to decarbonisation. During the last year or two, 
there have been some days uh, when no coal at all has been burned to generate electricity in the UK. And that's for the first time in 130 years. Last year, coal produced only 5% of all the electricity in the UK. And that was down from 33% just five years ago. I don't think most people realise how far the UK has, has come on this journey, the way we absolutely are, are at the front of this programme around the world. We've become a leader in decarbonising our power generation, and it's been driven by capital that increasingly wants to do good. Five years ago, most pension funds that we talked to and other institutions, they weren't that interested in this sector. Now they are, and it's partly because the sector is investable at scale, and it can deliver predictable, stable cash flows that are a good fit with the long-term liabilities of pension funds and so on. But I think it's also because pension funds are recognised. They want to be able to tell their members that their capital is doing some good. And in my experience, this is becoming a global phenomenon really quickly. A few weeks ago, I met a guy who was in London on a trip from a pension fund in Colombia. And uh, the first thing he wanted to talk about was how could they get exposure to renewables. You know, this really has, has spread amongst institutions throughout the world. And the encouraging thing is it, it's not just investment demand uh, from the likes of pension funds to own renewable assets that's growing. There's a surge in demand for using renewable electricity too. We never used to get calls from businesses wanting to buy renewable electricity from our solar farms. That just didn't happen a few years ago. Whereas now we have a dialogue with lots of companies. Most big businesses have got a policy of wanting to move towards the use of renewable energy. And this slide shows a selection of the businesses that are very quick to make a public commitment to this. But there are now many others that have done the same. And the way I always look at it is, do you want to be the only supermarket chain that can't say you're powered by renewable electricity? I think for any business amongst your staff, uh, your customers, your shareholders, your board, somewhere amongst that group, there'll be people who really care about what your strategy is in this area. A few years ago, not many businesses published sustainability reports or took the time to really think about what their strategy was in this sector. Uh, now most do. It's not a nice to have. I think it's very much what society expects. We've seen firsthand the evolution of the renewable sector from one which was utterly dependent on government subsidy when we started out to one which can now stand on its own two feet. When we started investing in renewables, uh, since we started investing in renewables, the price of a solar panel has fallen 85%. That's a phenomenal reduction in just seven years or so. And in sunny places like southern Italy, we're now able to build solar farms that are economically viable without any subsidy at all. The only source of revenue being from selling the power. And this, to me, is really significant. When an industry no longer needs to rely on subsidies or government support, it's not susceptible to being held back by politicians who are influenced by special interest groups. The sector can actually forge its own path. Now take Australia. We opened an office in Melbourne about a year or so ago. Seven or eight of our team relocated down there, looking to build solar farms down under. And the potential for solar in Australia is phenomenal. Uh, most parts of Australia apparently get 1.7 times as many hours of sunlight every year uh, as, as the UK does. They've got more land, they've clearly got the sun, and now I think they have the appetite. Historically, Australian energy policy has been pretty problematic. It's been very fractious because of the domestic coal lobby. Arguments over energy policy have cost the jobs of a number of Australian prime ministers in recent years. And while some forecasters will tell you that Australia will still be burning large amounts of coal to produce electricity 30 years from now, my own view is I just don't think there's any chance that will happen. And that is because the population won't allow it. They're not going to tolerate coal to be burned in large quantities for much longer. Already the main Australian banks have said they won't finance new coal mines, they won't finance new coal-fired power stations. And there's investor appetite. As Harry talked about a few minutes ago about millennials and their appetite, it's absolutely the case in Australia. 90% of millennials in Australia have said they want to be able to invest part of their super funds into renewables. It's a phenomenal level of uh, interest and desire for, for investment in this sector. People care, they want their money to do good. And I think it's inevitable that in countries like Australia, there is going to be rapid decarbonisation over the next five years or so. Now, according to calculations by Bloomberg, the global rollout of renewables over the next 20 years that's needed to hit the Paris targets is going to consume $7 trillion of funding. A phenomenal amount of capital. Uh, to put that into some kind of context, it's greater than the entire market capitalisation of all the companies listed on the London Stock Exchange. So renewables has the opportunity to become a very significant part of uh, asset allocation for investors. But it's only going to happen if the finance world, if those managing large pools of capital, 
choose to make the asset allocation decisions to invest heavily in this sector in the years ahead. But there are other areas that are also going to need, uh, need the support of investors. Uh, try and have a look at this chart. I'm sorry it's a bit uh, hazy. But what you hopefully can see is that emissions from generating electricity account for about a quarter of all uh, emissions. Um, there's significant amounts of emissions from the business sector. But the transport sector is now the largest source of emissions, something like 26%. And take a quick look at this chart. Have a look at the data on the right-hand side. Now, it's great that emissions from uh, power generation have fallen by 57% over the last 26 years or so. Uh, we're proud that in our own way we've played a little bit of a part in that through the solar and wind farms that we've built. But it's also really noteworthy that during the same time period there's basically been no change in emissions from transport. This, we feel, is the next frontier where there's a need for real action. And just as has happened in the energy sector, we feel it's a massive opportunity for investors to play their part in delivering change. Now, how many people talked about electric cars five years ago? Hardly anyone. Now, though, they are poised to become mainstream pretty quickly. Uh, and manufacturers of diesel-powered SUVs and other gas guzzlers that haven't yet cracked the EV transition, they're finding life really hard, as shown last week by Jaguar Land Rover's announcement of another 5,000 job cuts. People are holding back from buying new conventional cars. They want electric options. I can see this myself, just looking around uh, the car park at my kid's school. The, the old idea that everyone aspire to have a shiny new Range Rover seems to have changed really, really quickly. That's no longer seen as socially acceptable. And I think if manufacturers can crack issues like range anxiety, and if the country builds a proper charging network, uh, then I think buying an electric car will become the norm rather than an unusual, slightly quirky choice. And while the government created a bit of a stir in the media when they announced that from 2040 all cars were going to have to be zero emission, our view is it's going to be achieved a lot sooner than that. I keep telling my 11-year-old son that he's never going to grow up to drive a conventional car. He will be driving an electric vehicle. He may never even drive at all if autonomous vehicles uh, continue to, to, to evolve. Uh, a quote from Bill Gates comes to mind. We always overestimate the pace of change in the next two years uh, and underestimate it in the next ten. Uh, when you turn to other areas of transport, um, Transport for London expects uh, all new buses in London to be zero emission from 2025 and for all buses in London to be zero emission by a deadline of 2037. And it's good that we have those targets, and already there are several hundred electric buses on the streets of London, but why does it need to take that long for them all to become zero emission? Some cities in China have become zero emission for their public sector transport fleets already. Shenzhen made the transition in just two years, and it's now got 16,000 electric buses on the road. Now, I recognise that public sector finances are tight, but it's also why it feels like it's a great opportunity for impact investors to create solutions that deliver a range of financial and environmental benefits. And the prize from achieving this is really significant. Together, taxis and buses account for 41% of air pollution in London. 9,000 Londoners every year suffer a premature death as a result of health conditions caused by the poor air quality in the city. Getting old, polluting taxis and buses off the road as quickly as possible is clearly going to have a big impact on this. And it isn't just cars and buses that will go electric. Most types of vehicles could go zero emission. Even electric rubbish trucks are now becoming available. This one shown here is in trials in London at the moment. Uh, and EasyJet is talking about a plan to launch electric powered short haul passenger flights by 2030. Decarbonisation is fully underway. It's not an illusory land many years off. It's here and now. And innovative companies are developing the products that are going to provide these solutions. And we feel impact investors are going to be able to play their part in bringing this, all this to life. Uh, delivering the change that the world needs, the investment in renewables, or in decarbonising transport, or in backing the next generation of entrepreneurs, it's only going to happen if investors choose to make big asset allocation changes. And I'm in no doubt that they will, because I think in the end it's individuals that make the difference. Harry talked about the different types of investors looking at this, whether it's pension funds, family offices, insurance companies, but they all react to the world that they're part of. They all have staff who care about the role they play. They have boards who increasingly feel they have a responsibility to do more than just seek the highest returns. And I think because in the end, they will respond to what their own clients or customers tell them that they care about. We feel impact investing is 
more of a movement, a way of thinking and mindset than it is a specific asset class. Clearly embraces so many different areas, different types of investment, and we may all have slightly different views of what we consider impact to be or how it should be measured and defined. Uh, but rather than worrying about that, I think we should be enthused by the fact that investors increasingly want to put their money to work in a way that delivers real tangible benefits that go beyond financial returns. They truly do want to make a difference. We've noticed a real change over the past few years. Private banks and wealth managers that never used to want to talk to us about the asset classes we're in, they're now actively seeking impact investments for their clients. They're going out of their way to respond to the evolution of their client needs. Pension funds and other institutional investors are doing the same thing. I can't remember the last time I met a pension fund that didn't now regard ESG as being really important. I was at a, a pension fund conference a few months ago and one or two sessions about ESG and about um, thinking properly about the, the good that your money's doing. But in the end, it got weaved into every other session, no matter what the topic was, because that was the thing that people were, were really choosing to focus on, what they really cared about. In my senses, many investors are turning away from deploying capital into black box hedge funds and opaque asset classes of that type that have a habit of not delivering. And many are now starting to make allocations to impact funds. Great to see the evolution of that, that Harry showed us the data on a few minutes ago. And I feel very strongly this is not a short-term uh, a short-term trend or a passing fad or whatever. The importance of impact is absolutely here to stay. And for many investors, thinking about risk, return and impact is absolutely now at the heart of how they operate. We believe the UK has a great opportunity to make sure it builds on London's historic role in finance by becoming the leading centre for global impact investing, being the conduit for linking investors of all types, whether they're wealth managers, pension firms, family offices or individuals, with opportunities to put money to work in a way that really matters, backing entrepreneurs who are focused on transforming sectors, building housing to cater to the problems in society, fighting climate change, or caring for the elderly. Over the years, I've come to realize myself the power of impact and its importance as a force for good. I'm really excited by the opportunities that lie ahead for this industry, for all of us in this room to play our part in building a better, cleaner, fairer world. And to me, that is absolutely something that I'd be really proud to talk to my grandchildren about. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a great presentation. Uh, I'm Lisa Howe, a background in wealth management, and I agree um, electric vehicles are obviously going to become increasingly popular, but there's um, a bit of a problem with infrastructure, I think, at the moment. A, a lot of people who have electric vehicles at the moment sometimes have, have issues. Um, what do you think can be done to, to improve the infrastructure? Yeah, well, we spent a lot of time looking at this. Um, our energy team has met with a large number of um, businesses trying to roll out different types of charging infrastructure solutions and so on. Our energy business itself is, is very aware that for a lot of households now, this is, is part of their thinking. Um, I have an electric vehicle myself. I pretty much only ever charge it up at home. So I think there's a real bifurcated market. If you live outside big cities and you have a driveway and a garage or a plug on the outside of your house, whatever, charging your electric vehicle is not that much of a problem and how often do you do a journey that's hundreds of miles and if you do there are charging points on the motorway when I talk to colleagues who live in the centre of London they have a totally different problem saying well I have to park on the street it's all very difficult and so I think it's incumbent on energy companies the manufacturers of cars the charging networks we see a lot of change happening the energy companies are buying some of the charging infrastructure businesses I think the right solutions will evolve, I think it's going to take a bit of time, and I think there's going to be a few business models that probably turn out to be uh, a bit broken, um, but I, I think it's going to get there, and I think as the volume of demand grows, I've seen just in the space of two years how I think this whole, the whole attitude towards electric vehicles has just fundamentally changed. I didn't used to see any around, now I see quite a lot, and everyone I talk to seems to regard an EV as a possible choice rather than a totally unlikely choice uh, for the next vehicle. Some good opportunities then. 
going forward. Absolutely, and I think for, for those who can, who can figure out how the sector might evolve and are, are willing to back business models that can scale, um, I think there are. There seem to be a lot of entrepreneurs out there with really interesting ideas in this sector. Thank you very much. Quick question on, um, on your company itself. So how much of your assets right now, you would you deem, are going in towards, let's say, sustainability or ESG, which is not yet impact investing? Um, and how would you see that in 10 years, you know, taking the capital as a force for good? Yeah. Uh, well, in many ways, I'd say a lot of what we do, I would define in a, maybe in a, a broader way than many of you in this room would choose to, but our four main teams, three of them, I think, are, are doing some good in, in some way in that we're investing in renewable energy, we're doing healthcare infrastructure, we're doing venture capital. And I think, for the average layman, I think creating jobs, decarbonisation, dealing with demographics are creating some good. What we don't have is anyone sat behind a Bloomberg screen you know, dealing in derivatives or fixed income instruments or something. We're all about building real assets. And actually, when I see our teams, they feel really passionate about that. They like the fact that their day job is, is not something intangible. But actually, it's all about bringing real assets to life. Um, I think looking forward, this is what we're really anchoring our business around now. Uh, as, I, as I tried to articulate, we see a real step change in how pension funds in particular are looking to put capital to work. And I think that's an incredibly powerful trend. Many of these areas are going to consume large amounts of money going forward. And so sectors like renewables that years ago no one was that interested in, that rollout is only going to happen if the investment community chooses to put money to work in a very substantial way. And you look forward to a pension fund five years down the line. Is it going to have a 5% allocation in renewables at some point? Well, it's probably going to need to if, if that roll out towards the, the Paris um, targets is ever going to come to pass? Because where is that money going to come from otherwise? Um, you spoke at large about the uh, positive benefits of uh, EV vehicles, um, but this is not so clear at the moment of the environmental actually uh, impact because notably of the of the, the production of the batteries, uh, the utilization of raw earth and, and the lack of recycling system at the moment. So I was just like, have your view on the long-term kind of vision for the EV and, and your view on hydrogen vehicles as well, like how you compare yeah. these two alternatives at the moment? Okay. Um, the thing that we've particularly noticed is when I talked about companies and that, uh, that have been signing up to use renewable electricity, what's been really interesting over the past year or so is the way they've now also started saying, well, we're buying renewable electricity to power our supermarket chain or whatever. But the next thing we're trying to do is figure out how to deal with our fleet of trucks or vans and make them zero emission. And they, you know, they, there's this continual evolution of what businesses feel they need to be doing and, and what society is expecting of them. Um, we are pretty technology agnostic, so we're looking to try and create ways of putting capital to work to invest in these sectors. If it turns out that hydrogen becomes a winner for particular types of vehicles, as opposed to electric, we, you know, we're, we're pretty open-minded um, across that. Uh, we've got discussions underway at the moment with uh, or funding trials across a number of different things. We, um, we financed a fleet of electric vehicles at Heathrow, but we also know from talking to those guys that for some of the applications they're looking at, it's, it's probably going to be um, non-electric vehicles that turn out to be the right solution. And we want to see this transition happen it's a little bit like, do we want to invest in loads of solar farms or wind farms? We don't, we don't really mind. Uh, we want to play our part in achieving that, but we're pretty agnostic between specifics within a sector. Uh, Mike Davis, I'm one of the uh, Clearly Social Angel uh, group, um, also an investor in Octopus since 2012, I should, should say, just for the record. Um, I, I wonder, Chris, you mentioned um, housing as both a serious source of... Um, you know, of, of emissions um, in the sense of two of the issue, biggest issues you, you said in, in decarbonisation and demographics. I wonder what trends and impact you're seeing around residential housing or around construction of residential housing, because obviously we have a massive housing problem, yeah. but it's, it's an extremely unreconstructed industry. Yeah. So I was just interested in your perspective around that particularly. Uh, I think we see quite a lot of opportunities emerge. We've um, had a number of sort of quasi-public sector bodies or university 
entities coming to us to talk about plans for uh, essentially ultra-modern, ultra-smart housing and how investors could play a part in funding that kind of rollout, which is designed to be, you know, the kind of zero carbon home and, uh, and those kind of initiatives. Um, and through our energy company, what I think is really going to happen is um, an enormous push to, for the relationship to change. So just buying your electricity from British gas, you know, fast forward 10 years, actually, you're going to want to have your EV parked on the drive, which you could probably use as a battery. Uh, you're going to have all sorts of opportunities to time when you consume electricity in the home. Uh, I think a lot of people feel uh, heating in homes is likely to move towards um, electricity. Th this is all underway already, and what we're trying to do in our energy business is, is gear up for that by, um, by taking part in trials. We're taking part in a vehicle-to-grid trial at the moment. It's designed to look at opportunities to use the car as a battery. Um, we've been talking to a couple of universities about some of the... I, I think this is going to come about very quickly. Uh, and again, I think um, there's an opportunity for government to use grants and things like that to get a basic level of change needed, but I think it's going to be the private sector that really delivers the, the absolute step change here. Great. Th thanks very much, everyone, for your questions, and thank you very much to Chris for a fascinating talk. Please uh, join in a round of applause. Thanks. Thank